Thank you. And um, I want everybody to take note that the swine dysentery name is in quotations because I think, as you'll appreciate from this presentation, that that may not just be the classic swine dysentery that we're talking about and seeing reemerge in the in the U.S. And I would include in that the Canadian swine industry. Um, first, I want to start with the acknowledgments of all these people that have helped me put this presentation together by providing some of their data that they've done. Um, there's not one person doing all the research. It's multifaceted. And um, so a lot of the data comes from some of these people, and a lot of the work comes from these people as well. So, And there may be people on this list that aren't named. But um, swine dysentery, just to, to remind everybody or teach everybody for the first time, uh, we didn't learn about this in veterinary school necessarily. It was probably a, a one-liner. But because it wasn't here. It was kind of not in the industry. It had been eradicated, per se. Um, but it is swine dysentery, bloody scours, is a mucohemorrhagic tiflocolitis of swine. It's a worldwide distribution, and the first case dates back to 1921 in the U.S. Um, the actual bug and cause of swine dysentery was, was kind of co-described in, in the U.K. and the United States in 71 and 72 by Taylor and Harris, and these were kind of independent discoveries uh, led to the same, same bacteria. And in the, um, in the early 90s, it seemed that swine dysentery just went away, uh, whether that was because of the changing industry, the three-site production that was going on, early weaning efforts, um, genetic companies really starting from scratch, all-in, all-out production, um, effective management and medications that were in the feed and being used routinely, and then really the consolidated industry that was, that was occurring in the 90s. And then there were a lot of uh, eradication efforts for pseudorabies that a lot of people will attribute uh, eradication of other diseases or diminishing prevalence of other diseases because of the focus on pseudorabies. And then widespread use of feed antibiotics that at the time seemed to be highly effective for swine dysentery. Um, and then in 2004, 2005, the timeline's a little, little gray on when we actually started to see a significant reemergence. If you talk to the diagnostic labs, there would always be maybe one or two cases of swine dysentery that would come through the diagnostic lab every year. Usually it was a smaller producer, maybe some out, outdoor uh, unit type things, but, but it was n never really a significant problem in the industry until we started seeing these cases develop in about 04 or 05. So this is data from Iowa State out of 190, uh, excuse me, 1,997 cases where they cultured a brachiospire species. And um, basically they would classify it into three different categories. as either true swine dysentery, which was brachiospire highway dysentery, spiroketocolitis, which is uh, its cousin, Pilus coli, and then this idiopathic colitis where they would see colitis, they'd see disease, but they would get a brachiospire that was not typed as highway dysentery or Pilus coli. And then cases at uh, the University of Minnesota Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, uh, one thing that you can notice here is that Minnesota seems to um, have an increase in this non-typable brachyspira, which is clinically causing the disease but is not typing out as classic hyodysentery, um, which is why the swine dysentery was in quotations on the title slide. If we look at the differentials for finishing and arise, I think this is a very important component, and for me it's very impo important is the differential list of NRIs and finishing. Because oftentimes when you've got guys that are walking through the barns that aren't trained veterinarians, aren't trained pathologists, um, don't open up pigs, don't take diagnostic samples, they walk by scouring pigs and it's ileitis or it's salmonella. And that's pretty much the differential list for, for swine uh, growth finished diarrhea on a, on a practical scheme. And then you start entering, entering into that equation brachyspire species of which there are multiple. PCV2 associated enteritis that we saw uh, several years ago. TG, um, E. coli can occur in finishing, although it is rare. Um, parasites, namely Trichurosuus, and then the recent increase in corn costs causes us to do different things with our feed, and I think that agitates the colon, and it makes some of these diseases a little bit more prevalent uh, or more predominantly seen in finishing pigs. So what's in the name? Dysentery, by definition, is diarrhea containing blood or mucus. That's whether it's swine or humans. Um, or any other species. Swine dysentery, specifically in the literature, focuses on disease caused by brachyspira hyodysentery, the species. Um, swine spiroketocolitis, which is uh, brachyspira pilus coli, has been around, and, and we've kind of known it's been there for the past couple of years, and I wonder at times if we've uh, stopped at culturing brachyspira without speciating the, maybe the past five to ten years that we've been seeing it. Um, there are other brachyspira species in the literature that affect swine. B. Innocens, B. Intermedia, B. Murdoch. Um, in 1982, paper by Andrews um, at the National Veterinary Lab, uh, excuse me, at the National Meeting, um, Brachyspira Not So Innocent, where they took this innocent Brachyspira, or Brachyspira Innocens, and was actually causing clinical disease, where it should not. 
Um, it's gone through several name changes. Initially, dysentery was thought to be caused by Vibrio, Campylobacter, Trichomonads, etc. And then when it was finally described as Serpolina, then it became um, Treponema, and now is Brachyspira, and who knows what it will turn into. So part of this just shows the confusion of, of trying to understand what this bug is actually doing and what's, what's going on. Um, but what about the cases that we're seeing now? We have blood and mucus without BHIO, okay? It's culture positive. It has the, the clinical characteristics of uh, historical brachyspira hyodysentery. You culture it on blood agar plate. It has a strong hemolysis. It has this ring phenomenon, which I'll show you a picture of. And in, in, the, in the late 70s, early 80s, that was the diagnosis for BHIO. It was the culture characteristics and the clinical signs. But now that we have PCR technology, it does not PCR out as hyodysentery or pilus coli. So what is it? Um, we also have BHIO cases in pigs where we do not see clinical disease. So then I ask, is it significant in that flow of pigs? Um, we also have these non-typical brachyspira, which I'll talk about. And two comments that I think are real nice when you start uh, looking into the literature and the presentations is uh, Bob Glock's comment on you don't want anything that looks like dysentery, or you don't want dysentery anything that looks like it. And um, Ken Schwartz's comment, the blood mucus in the stool can't be a good thing. So it doesn't really matter what it types out as. Um, so in general, do we, do we need to talk about this as just a generalized swine brachyspirosis disease um, or brachyspira-associated colitis or a porcine enteric disease complex? Uh, the respiratory guys have a respiratory complex, and I think the enteric guys need theirs. <laughs> um, but, but all these things are important when you start to discuss the diagnosis of the disease, when you start talking about depopulation eradication efforts um, and successful eradication efforts and how you're going to monitor that um, post-depopulation or post-treatment, all these things come into play. And so cases in point, um, this is where the reviews come in, and a lot of this work was done by other groups. Um, so this is a case report out of um, really with the Novartis guys that have done it over the past two summers, brachyspira hyodysentery in a system. The thing that's important on this slide is if you look at um, what you're seeing is grades of diarrhea through weeks and finishing. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the grades of diarrhea or show you some images, but basically a grade one would be a, a cow patty type of looseness. Grade two would be watery. Grade three would have blood and or mucus in the stool. And if you look at in 67% um, of the sites they looked at in this, this particular system, were characterized as kind of the, the top level where you really started to see this blood mucus develop about eight or nine weeks placed into finishing. Okay? But more importantly, I think that on this slide and on the next slide is that 33% of the sites that were hyodysentery positive showed no blood or mucus on clinical evaluation during the entire phase of finishing. When they took those grades of diarrhea and they sent culture to Iowa State University, sure, 90, close to 90% of the grade three diarrhea came back culture positive for hyodysentery. What stuck out with me when I saw this slide two summers ago was that 63% of the grade two diarrheas were positive for BHIO. And they did not test grade one diarrhea. And so we did some additional work this past summer and were able to find in this, this common ileitis, loose, just cow patty type of stool, you can get BHIO cultured out of those stools. Um, this is work we did last summer with a, a student and basically shows our um, clinical signs by sites that were positive for these brachyspira species. And as you can see, recently placed pigs in finish in weeks 3 to week 12 is where we see a majority of the looseness, generalized looseness. But if, if you look at the top, um, the very top red portion is the percentage of pens within these sites that had blood and or mucus. And that's a very small percentage of those sites, and it's very intermittent. So from a clinical standpoint, it's easy to walk through a finishing barn and not see classic swine dysentery. Um, this is work done by uh, Trevor Schwartz, a rising third year um, veterinary student at Iowa State University. And they looked at three different brachyspire species. One was a classic brachyspire hyodysentery, and two species that grew with culture characteristics of strong hemolysis, ring phenomenon, but were not typed out PCR as hyodysentery. So these would be at to, at to this point, non-typal brachyspira that had caused clinical, clinical cases that had come into the diagnostic lab. And so they inoculated um, negative pigs with this, and basically there was no distinction between the three. They all caused severe clinical disease. Um, the things that were interesting, they, um, this BS1 isolate actually had the most number of days where the pigs exhibited dysentery compared to the brachyspira high dysentery isolates. Um, 
If you look, they both induce similar, or all three induce similar disease. They were unable to differentiate swine dysentery from the brachiospire associated colitis by clinical signs, lesions, and culture characteristics. Um, and these are just some examples of, of the, the pigs that they tested. And if, if you look in the field and you see colons that are that red, that irritated, it, it probably doesn't matter whether it was higher dysentery or BS1 or BS2. It's causing clinical impact in those pigs. Um, some additional work that was done at the University of Minnesota looking at brachiospire species that are not typed as hyodysentery. 70% of the species that go through the um, University of Minnesota Diagnostic Lab from 2008-2010 were untypable. 79 of these isolates, they were culture positive. They PCR'd on the um, normal multiplex for Bhyopilus coli as negative. So they did some additional sequencing work. 56 of these became, and these were all clinical isolates from clinical cases of, of grow finished diarrhea. 56 came back very similar to B. Murdaki um, from a, uh, a sequence analysis, four of B. innocent, and 19 unidentified Serpilina species. Um, work out of Canada and John Harding's group is a novel brachiospire species associated with a hemorrhagic and necrotizing colitis. And so basically they've, they've seen this on multiple farms. They're currently calling it brachiospire um 30446. Iowa State has this primer that they've been using to identify this um, in their diagnostic lab and are, and are actively running that. But basically, it it's sections out or types out differently than hyodysentery or pilus coli. We're not sure if these are uh, similar isolates from the Primus report that I just uh, indicated. But one thing that you hear in the industry is a lot of the Canadian pigs that have come into the Minnesota, north, northern Iowa region and wondering if maybe this isn't the same isolate that Minnesota has been picking up. But I, that work has not been done. Um, this is work we did last summer, basically looking at trying to correlate the clinical diarrhea we were seeing in the pigs with histological lesions, gross lesions, and the diagnostic test of what pathogens were there, namely with a focus on brachiospire hyodysentery. What we saw, and, and this represents uh, to date not 105 pigs individually from uh, 38 different finishing sites. And this is basically the percentage of pigs that were diagnosed. The biggest diagnosis we had was no diagnosis. Colitis, um, clinical disease, but not being able to get any sort of agent identified. Lawsonia as a singular infection was the next highest. And then subsequent to that, one of our biggest things we saw was the Lawsonia and Brachiospira species all lumped together co-infection. If we look at the percent of, uh, excuse me, the presence of pathogen by the grade of diarrhea. So I'm a clinical veterinarian. I walk out into the field and I see cow patty type diarrhea. I'm going to say ileitis. If I see blood and mucus, I'm going to say dysentery. But if we actually do the work, there's no statistical difference between the groups. You're just as likely to have Lawsonia in a in blood and mucus, and you're just as likely to have B. higher dysentery in a grade one diarrhea. If we look at the gross lesions that are present, so we open up the colon, the large intestine, and, and look at what lesions are there, reddening, thickened mucosa, granular appearance, fibrinonecrotic debris, uh, or whether the tissue is edematous, there's no statistical difference by pathogen that's detected. When we look at histological lesion present, actually the only thing that came out significant in our work was the presence of mucus. Um, it is significantly more prevalent in cases of BHIO histologically, but there's no difference between that and the unknown diagnosis, okay? So if, we, if you submit samples and you get nothing back for uh, diagnostic, or you get no agent back, but you see uh, increased mucus in the colon, you may want to do additional testing, go back out to the farm, look for brachiospire species, start chasing that down. Um, this is from our work as well. If you look on the left-hand side, this is kind of more of a classic um, BHIO type of gross lesion. We've got reddened of the, the large intestine and the colon and excessive mucus production. This was a grade two. So there was no blood or mucus being passed in this feces at the time of identifying these pigs. Um, if we look on the right hand side, this pig also had a grade two diarrhea. It's significantly less severe from a gross standpoint, but we culture brachiospire hyodysentery out of this pig. So clinically, Historically, we would see the mucohemorrhagic diarrhea. I'm going to move through these slides uh, fairly quickly. But what we're seeing today is, is highly variable clinical 
disease. Okay, and so on the right hand side of the top picture is basically the cow patty, the grade one type of diarrhea. In the middle is more of a watery type of diarrhea, but there is blood digested in that. And on the bottom picture, there is a lot more mucus and, and very little amount of blood in that diarrhea. Um, the interesting thing is that we see variable mortality rates where historically it was 30 to 50 percent. You knew you had high mortality. You knew you had um, blood and mucus in the diarrhea. And it's easily missed through a barn walkthrough. Easily missed. We're hunting for this this past summer looking for it. And you would find it in one pen out of 36 in a barn. And you would find it. But you would not see that on a 10, 15 minute walkthrough. Um, these are some of the pigs more severe that we would see with sort of the classic uh, peri perineal staining, blood and mucus. The wet cement type of diarrhea, grade one. Grade two is more watery. Um, grade three with blood. Grade four with just, or excuse me, grade three with just mucus. Um, let's get through some of this. Diagnosis, um, really historically, clinical signs were enough. Uh, Roy Schultz's comment is you didn't need a diagnostic lab to diagnose swine dysentery. You saw it and that's what it was. Um, but now I think you need to incorporate all five of these things and it may be multiple times that you need to do these. So basically, um, sample collection, what we like to do is, is you can get it out of feces, um, out of diarrhea samples and swabs or collected with a, a spoon or a bag, but it needs to be collected fresh and it needs to be sent to the diagnostic lab immediately. I think there is some time transit issues. If you collect it on a Friday and it's a poor sample collection, you will not culture it. Um, you will miss it. And I think in this case, a false negative is much more severe than a false positive. Um, but what we like to do is um, if we're really hunting for it and looking for it, we'll screen with fecal samples. And if we get something back that looks uh, suspicious or positive, we'll go back and confirm it with tissues. And we'll focus on the large intestinal component and also look for other diseases that may be there that we need to control. Um, the gross lesions, again, just, just reiterate kind of what I've showed you so far is the reddening, the thickness, the hemorrhage, uh, hemorrhage the mucus production. You'll see pseudomembranes. Uh, a lot of times we'll see co-infections with Lawsonia and Brachyspira that you're not really sure which is contributing to it. But uh, again, just because you're opening pigs and not seeing severe lesions doesn't mean that you're not going to find a Brachyspira species, uh, particularly higher dysentery. On histopath, some of the, the hallmark lesions are mucosal and submucosal necrosis, lymphoplasmocytic inflammation, hyperplasia of the goblet cells, and actually visible, visibly seeing spirochetes in the lumens and the crypts as you can see with the, the special stain on the right-hand side. Um, this is some classic, uh, classic histological lesions out of some classic clinical sign pigs that we had. See the mucus, see that, yeah. The mucus here on the surface with the mucosal erosion, evidence of hemorrhage, lymphoplasmocytic inflammation, um, spirochetes are actually visible in the clonic crypts. And then in addition to that, there's this goblet, health, goblet cell hyperplasia. Um, in addition, this case also had Lawsonian, so you, you see the crypt cell hyperplasia, kind of adenomatosis lesions. And then if you zoom in, I don't know how well it shows up, you can actually see the spirochetes. However, this could be Pilus coli, this could be Innocens, this could be some other brachyspira. So what we need to do is culture it. This was the classic technique. You can do it from rectal, scru rectal swabs, colonic scraping, or feces, or um, and there's some debate on what is the best sample, but I think colonic scrapings, that actual tissue is probably the best. Uh, it's on a selective blood auger, and um, historically you needed to actually request it at, this at Iowa State. They didn't normally do that. And so if you weren't looking for it, if you didn't have it in your mind, you weren't going to run the diagnostic test. Now I believe at both of Iowa State and the University of Minnesota, on any grow finished diarrhea case that comes in, it's, it's a standard portion of the workup. Um, you get this strong hemolysis pattern and this ring phenomenon when you punch into the auger. And what you'll see on the diagnostic report, at least at Iowa State, is they will comment on the hemolysis pattern, uh, the ring phenomenon. But if you look down here at the bottom and see, these are all three of these pigs were collected from the same site, the same barn. Okay? Um, we have one that is Pilosicoli, and we have one that is Bihio, and we have one that is grows like Bihio, PCRs is Pilosicoli. Um, the PCR is usually performed on culture isolates. However, some of the new tests that are, that are being developed are straight out of fecal samples or the colonic mucosal scrapings. Um, 
and then there's additional sequencing that can be done in the 16S ribosome using novel primers. And so this is kind of the current test that's being being reported on the Iowa State Diagnostic Report. And as you can see, this sample here, sample B was an individual pig, is PCR positive for hyodysentery as well as B. murdochi and B. innocence. And they are also currently testing for the um, the Canadian novel isolate, the Saskatoon um, 30446. So economically, it's estimated at about $12 a pig, although um, with feed conversion being one of the biggest historical drivers, you can tell that that number can go up pretty substantially with five, six, seven dollar corn. Um, average daily gain mortality can be twice as uh, what it normally is, and this is kind of the, the current picture that we're seeing. Um, increase in lightweight pigs, variation in, in size and growth obviously has probably an inherent cost that we don't truly understand. Um, medication costs from anywhere from 50 cent to three dollars per head. Uh, the eradication costs and the system management adjustments. And I cannot put a number to that system management adjustments. And what I mean by that is in a system as large as ours or even, even smaller systems that have multiple farms that have their own transportation component, their own maintenance component, the rerouting of trucks, the special uh, restrictions that you have to put on movement of animals, movement of people, equipment, et cetera, there's a cost to that that, that we really can't put a dollar value to um, that hits the bottom line. Um, some work that was done with uh, the Demartis group a couple summers ago was they actually tried to put some current dollar amounts to it. The assumptions are at the bottom, but, but they averaged about $9 a pig uh, impact on this. And this can differ probably by the clinical severity. So we see, we see classic swine dysentery, blood and mucus, you can't miss it on a walkthrough. There's probably more of a substantial impact on a clinical disease like that versus this subclinical disease that we're kind of seeing now um, in some other flows. The problem is, is I know a lot of systems and talking with people have a struggle with what this impact is. Um, you know, it used to be you had swine dysentery, everybody knew what the impact was, you got rid of it, you eradicated, you medicated, you got rid of swine dysentery. But now we're seeing good performance on positive farms. Um, we're also seeing bad performance on positive farms. And so there's always this relationship of management and other co-diseases that are there. And if in some cases, if I can change the management, if I can change sanitation on that farm, if I can get rid of, say, Lawsonia, I start vaccinating for Lawsonia, I may not have a clinical impact that's significant. I may be able to, quote, unquote, live with brachyspire hyodysentery. Um, I think there is a difference between naive and chronic disease. So if I have a positive site and I'm buying feeder pigs that are negative for hyodysentery, but my site is positive, I will see a more clinical, more severe clinical impact. If I'm buying pigs that are positive from a sow farm that's positive, I do not believe that my clinical impact is as severe. Um, what the impact on the sow farm is, I don't, I don't know, um, other than producing positive pigs. And, and one of the things that in today's industry, swine dysentery is a social disease. And there are a lot of people out there that are denying it. I know we probably denied initially the uh, impact of swine dysentery. And the other thing is if you do not look for it, you do not have it. And I really stress the, the point of, of you need to be looking for it. I, am, I myself uh, was in denial that we would even have swine dysentery in some of the operations I'm responsible for. And we start looking for it, guess what, we find it. And part of the challenge with that is because it did not look clinical. It did not look textbook. You know, I do not have blood and mucus in diarrhea in my finishing pigs, so therefore higher dysentery isn't there. But when you start looking and you see this new clinical disease, yes, it is there. And so um, admittance is the first step, right? Um, for therapy, um, there's a, a study that was done, I believe it was uh, last year or the year before started, 80 isolates from the United States to look at MIC, current MIC values for this. And, and I do need to note that there are no established breakpoints or uh, internationally established methods for estimating sensitivity to break spira. So that, that is a caveat in this, this data you're about to see. But, um, so this information is, is specific to Carbidox and the percentage of isolates and the MIC value for those. And what I've done in red is, is put in the estimated, based on literature, all the references are down at the bottom, what the estimated colon concentration of that drug is at the um, recommended feeding relative to the MICs. And so that's for Carbidox. Um, the, uh, the pink line here is Tiamulin or Denigard, which would be important to us in the United States and its relationship at the different um, feed and water-soluble levels. 
and then in uh, green, which would be important to us in grow finish, the Linko MIC values. Um, and then so, so the first question when you diagnose it in a farm or a system, whether you're a, um, a mixed animal practitioner or a swine veterinarian or you work with a corporation, is do you treat it, do you control it, or do you eradicate it? And at the end of the day, um, as a veterinarian, I need to provide all three options to my client, whether I work for that client or um, I have a different relationship with that client. And so the first thing we need to understand is the epidemiology and biosecurity of hyodysentery. And still today, um, I don't know that anybody will argue this, the number one way to give pigs a disease is to put them with a pig that has that disease. And so infected pigs and buying purchased pigs that are positive for hyodysentery, whether you know it or not, is still the highest risk factor. And then after that, we have people, we have equipment, we have trucks, all the things that we've learned about um, in the past 10 to 15 years and, and really not learned about, just kind of remembered, um, is that these things can transmit disease into a farm. When we start looking at the epidemiology and eradication efforts, one of the big components that we try and focus on is the pest component because we know that it can live in mice for 180 plus days, in rats for two days, and maybe even longer, um, dogs, cats, birds, other pests, animals that are on the farm. So once you get all the pigs off the farm, you still have other animals that you need to contend with. And then it's survival in feces, moist feces, soil, feces and water. Um, these, are, these are long periods of time that need to be addressed in an eradication effort. Um, control, there is no vaccine. Immunity is incomplete and poorly understood, and so there is no ability to vaccinate for this disease. Sanitation is huge. As with any enteric disease, sanitation is big. Strategic medication um, and effective medication. Reducing risk factors, particularly the rodents, and then controlling all these co-infections that may make the disease more severe, like Lawsonia um, or Salmonella. Eradication, the, the, there are two main ways to eradicate dysentery. The first is by treatment. Um, there's the Danish model listed there. The important thing with the Danish model is, is the constant medication of every animal on site in addition to cleaning every day, washing behind animals, washing down manure, getting that source of reinfection away from the animals every day for an extended period of time. The estimated cost of this is about 10 or $15 per sow. Um, and, and these costs will differ, obviously, based on what you're paying for Tim Ulan, where you are, um, how, how big the herd is, and how long or what plan you use. Uh, some of the plans are more extensive than others. In addition to that, eradication by depopulation. Um, the, the most important thing with this is we've learned, obviously, with other things like PERS and other diseases, is you have to be confident in your biosecurity to go through the eradication. If you're going to eradicate it and walk it right back into the farm a week later, there's no point in trying to eradicate the disease by depopulation until you're ready. And that reinfection can be either with the flow, you continue to put in, per, uh, excuse me, hyodysentery or these brachiospirus species positive pigs right back into the farm, you've completely deplete, defeated the purpose. Um, maybe your system is positive, so you have pressure from, from other farms that are in your system or nearby, or even the surrounding <laughs> reservoirs. And maybe that's somebody else's company that's outdoor, feral hogs, whatever the, the source is. Maybe it's a, a coal plant or a packing plant that's nearby. You need to understand those. And there is benefit of eliminating other agents with depopulation, uh, particularly if you are a multiplication type herd or selling genetics. There's other diseases that we can eradicate and maybe gain, gain some benefit from. But during the eradication, your focus has got to be on the following. And the first and, and biggest one is the communication of the reason and the goals for doing this eradication. Um, everybody that is involved needs to understand what we're doing and the importance of eradicating the disease and where the risk factors of reintroduction are. Um, second, obviously, remover of manure and the pigs. I, I guess I need to put pigs in here because there are partial depopulation programs out there, and a lot of times those are very difficult to um, to have successful because you still have those animals remaining on some portion of the site. Removal of manure, removal of rodent vectors is one we focus on. We feel pretty good. We can get all the pigs off site and we can get the barns clean. Where we fail a lot of times is getting all the rodents off the site. Um, wash, disinfectant, dry, and uh, downtime. We use a four to six week downtime depending on the time of the year. And that really is, that downtime is to focus on getting rid of the rodent population. Um, we can get the barns pretty clean. And then there's this big question about lagoons um, or slurry systems or deep, bed, uh, deep bedded barns where how long does that 
pathogen actually live and, and continue to be infective to the animals. And we're actually going to do some work this summer looking at um, the survivability of that in lagoons. Some work has been done, um, but we kind of want to redo some of that work. And so the take home for this whole presentation is, is at least from a clinical standpoint, because again, I am in the barns, um, hopefully on a day-to-day -day basis, but in the barns looking at these animals. And, and kind of my message is, is, is to other people, other veterinarians that are out there that are in barns that don't think they have it or are not very familiar with brachyspira disease in general, but diagnosis of grow finish diarrhea, especially reoccurring or non-responsive to therapy or vaccination um, in the case of ileitis, should encompass a complete herd evaluation, history, and diagnostic workup. And this should involve all the potential differentials including the brachyspira species as a whole with the ancillary characterization. Um, necessary points, I think, and, and swine dysentery is back. It's here. I don't think that it's re-emerging. I think it has emerged. It's here um, and it's out there. Clinically, it may not be textbook. Um, diagnosis can be very challenging and very frustrating. We need to educate or re-educate our swine veterinarians and anybody that's in seeing swine in the field. And uh, we've done this at, at North Carolina State, but I think every veterinary curricula needs to reintroduce swine dysentery. I talked with, I talked with a lot of students, and even currently after we've been dealing with this for the, the past four to five years, that we've known it's out there, we still do not talk about swine dysentery in the veterinary curricula on, in some pretty major school, in some veterinary universities that are classically food animal, large animal veterinarian oriented. So I think we, if you have association with any of the universities in your area, um, make sure that somebody is talking to them about swine dysentery and that it still exists in U.S. pig production.